Well, hello, everyone. We are very glad to see you all today as we get started and kick this webinar off. Um, we um, will be learning about rural health workforce resources, uh, specifically related to Delta doctors and AmeriCorps. We're very excited for the presentation today. As you may have noticed, it, ha it is being recorded and it will be posted to our website and we'll send you a link to that recording and, and the slides and any other documentation um, to the participants at the um, end of the webinar. My name is Kim Mayo and I am the program manager with the National Rural Health Resource Center, which is providing today's webinar. Um, we would love to see your bright shining faces if you're able to connect your video feature. Um, and you can do that by selecting the camera icon in the lower left corner of that screen of your screen there. Your audio is muted by default, um, just to avoid any background noise. If we would love to hear from you though, if you do have a question or comment, please unmute um, your line. Or if you're calling in, you can hit star six. You can press star six to unmute, and that will also remute you once you're ready to do that. And otherwise, we do ask that you stay on mute, just again, to avoid any of that background noise. You can use that chat box. We'd love to hear from you from that way as well um, for any communication that you may have. And that is also located in that, um, the, the bottom ribbon um, of, your, of the screen there, that ribbon at the bottom of your screen. And if you haven't already, we invite you to take a moment and type your name, your organization, and your title. Um, in that chat box, and that really helps us to know who's here with us today. The National Rural Health Resource Center is a nonprofit organization dedicated to sustaining and improving health care in rural communities. The center is the TA provider for the Delta Region Community Health Systems Development Program. And the Delta Program, or DRCHSD, um, we are uh, funded by the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy in collaboration with the Delta Regional Authority. The center um, is committed to diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism and building a culture where difference is valued. And you can learn more about this commitment on our website. We do have several upcoming webinars that you ha should have received information about that we'd like to draw your attention to. In the month of May, May 18th, and May 11th and May 18th, we'll have some quality improvement. Uh, we'll have a quality improvement series that will be fantastic that you'll want to join us for. And then in the month of June, we have a couple of um, application and eligibility webinars. So if there are sites that you know of that are interested in learning more about the program and the application process, please, um, we would love for the, to invite them. So please send them either the link or um, send them to us and we will be happy to get them invited. We have one for hospitals and FQHCs specifically, and then we'll have one later in the month of June for rural health clinics or small clinics. Okay, as I'm introducing today's speaker, we've got three polling questions that have been pulled up, and I'll let you all complete those um, as, as I introduce our speakers today. We have um, two fabulous speakers with us that I'm very, very excited about. Um, Tamika Eatman is, on, is an Assistant Program Director at the AmeriCorps National um, Civilian Service Corps that's in CCC. Um, the Southeast region, which uh, the campus, which is located in Vicksburg and Mississippi. And she has been serving with the agency for 10 years. And she uh, develops projects and provides grant application assistance through the states of Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, and Tennessee. As the assistant program director, she supports the NCCC members, staff, and external partners in the planning, development, and coordination of projects helping to identify needed resources, timelines, and metrics for success. She is a proud AmeriCorps alum who um, attributes her service year as an American Corps a Promise Fellow to a career dedicated to service, youth development, project planning, and training. We also have Christina, Christina Wooden with us today as well. 
She joined the Delta Regional Authority in uh, March of 2016. She oversees DRA health programs, including Delta Doctors Program, Innovative Readiness Training Program, and the Delta Region Community Health Systems Development Program, and the Delta Region Rural Workforce, Rural Health Workforce Training Program. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration from the University of Missouri at Columbia and a Master's degree in Public Administration from the University of Louisiana at Monroe. She is a graduate of the Delta Leadership Institute and Harvard University's Executive Leadership Academy. She has over 15 years of experience in community development. She is originally from Carothersville, Missouri, and she is an active yoga instructor, running enthusiast, and enjoys spending time with her children and dogs. So I'm very excited. I believe Tamika will be kicking us off today, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Kim. Happy to be here with you all today. Um, so I'm happy to talk about AmeriCorps and Triple C and how we can assist and partner with the folks that are on this call in helping you to accomplish your goals. Um, as, go ahead and go to the next slide. So um, with AmeriCorps, um, hopefully some of you on the call have either worked with AmeriCorps before or have heard about us, uh, but we're um, a federal service agency uh, and there's an umbrella of several different types of programs that fall within us. We have AmeriCorps seniors, which for those who are 55 and plus can serve with AmeriCorps seniors. And we have three different types of programs there, but then we have also state national, um, our NCCC program, National Civilian Community Corps, which I'll be talking about today, and our VISTA program. And under NCCC, we also have an umbrella program underneath that, which is FEMA Corps. Uh, next slide. So just, just to give you kind of insight into the, the three different types of AmeriCorps programs, Volunteers in Service to America, AmeriCorps, America, excuse me, um, which is our VISTA program has been around for a long time, um, even before we had kind of AmeriCorps and it may be something that you're familiar with. Um, the VISTA members are serving with, with poverty focus. So their, their focus is also to do capacity building. So they're there for year round support, but then also um, they're there to assist with what would be volunteer recruitment, um, anything that deals with capacity. Maybe that means more promotions, things of that area. Um, so um, helping to identify financial resources, things of that nature. So that's what our VISTA members are doing. With the state and national, they're also a year round support. Uh, they also have some programs where we're starting to look at offering short, shorter terms for all of these different programs, but they're mostly a year round support program. They are our largest AmeriCorps program. Um, so if you think about things, if you ever heard of City Year or those types of programs, a lot of times they are education or conservation focused, um, but they have a lot of different areas depending on what state uh, you're in um, may kind of guide what types of AmeriCorps programs those are out there. And then we as uh, in Triple C is more of the team-based program. We're the short-term high impact program that comes in for a period of time. Uh, a lot of times we'll have a lot of projects in urban and rural development, a lot of disaster projects, uh, we have teams now serving to support areas that have been impacted by tor recent tornadoes, things of that nature. Um, so we are that program that um, is that you have about eight to 10 folks on a team that come for a short period of time, knock out projects, and then they're on their way to another community. Let's move on to the next slide. So this is what our regions fall. And I'm just curious, I started to see as some of you were uh, putting in the chat your titles, some of you listed what state you were from. I, saw, I think I saw that some were, we had someone from Alabama, which is one of the states that I helped develop projects for. I think I also saw someone from Arkansas and Missouri that's in our Southwest uh, region that's on the call. Um, but yeah, feel free to, I would love to kind of know where everyone's, um, where they're from and what state they're following, because depending on that, that that decides on what region you you would fall in and who would help to support you. But you see that the southern region um, is a 20 state uh, 
region that I work out of is a 20 state uh, and territory region. Um, we are located in Mississippi, but we cover quite a span of area from, you know, DC and court, including Puerto Rico, and then um, uh, several of the states that fall within, I know the, the, the folks that are supported in this call. So uh, next slide, please. So just to tell you a little bit about our AmeriCorps members that serve in AmeriCorps and Triple C, they are uh, 18 to 26, uh, so young adults. Um, we have an average age of 20, 20 to 21. We are seeing in the last couple of years that on our traditional side that we're seeing a little bit younger age, uh, kind of that, that gap year age, uh, maybe one year of college, things of that nature, or, you know, before they get ready to go to college, they're coming coming to us, but that's just more recent. But overall, we have a, a wide range of members that in all of those ages. Our team leaders are mid, typically mid-20s, but they can be any age. Um, and so usually they come in with a lot of passion, a lot of energy, and ready to help support the different communities that they know that they're going to go and, and get to experience and help to serve. Um, so they do come in with, you know, beginner level, level skills, but they, you know, they have the energy to make up for that. Right. Next slide, please. So the year is organized. Our members come in the middle of the summer uh, and they serve for 10 months. And generally, uh, they'll serve four to eight projects. So they go from one community to the next. So they could be within our region serving in Mississippi. Um, in August, and then if, maybe by October, they're serving in Florida, um, and then going up to Massachusetts, and then coming back to Tennessee. So it's just a range of different projects that they, they serve on while they're serving for their 10 months of service. And generally, the projects are four to eight weeks in length, but they can be as short as two to three weeks if need be, depending on the needs of the agency um, and the organization that's making the request. And they can go all the way up to 10 weeks at a time. And you can, uh, I'll show you the, we'll look at the kind of the, the calendar up soon. And you can see that there's multiple opportunities to apply throughout that 10 months um, that our members serve. Our areas of service include urban and rural development, infrastructure improvement, natural and other disasters. So um, in the urban and rural development, I would say majority of kind of our hospitals and those types of supporting agencies fall within the urban and rural development category. Um, that's kind of a wide span, <laughs> um, different things. Also things like habitat bills, things of that nature fall within that. Um, our infrastructure improvement is probably another area where if there's any building improvements, things of that nature that would fall in the infrastructure. Um, then also, if, if an agency or organization is being impacted by disaster, um, there's an opportunity to fall within that category as well. Uh, for the others, the environmental stewardship, when you think about trail building, our members are doing that, those types of things. And then energy conservation, when you're thinking about maybe, uh, when you're thinking about maybe energy efficient light bulbs, installing those or other um, rain barrels, other things of that nature are kind of more in the lines of our energy conservation um, area. All right, next slide, please. So just to give you a little bit more idea of what some of the things that they've done in different um, in supporting different hospitals in the in the past few years, um, a lot of them have filled kind of what you would maybe think of um, in the past as candy striper roles um, and they're helping to support uh, in that type of way. So in, you know, helping with the food prep. And I think some of the pictures here uh, kind of show that helping with some of the meal delivery um, and those types of tasks. But then also maybe helping with the screening and switchboard operation um, and taking calls and things of that nature um, has been something. Also, when you think about types of warehouse or stocking and things, uh, keeping those, um, those that up and going and keeping that organized, um, they've been helpful with that, along with environmental services support. Uh, talking about public facility rehabilitation, I know that in some of the hospitals um, that they've served in the past, we've had members um, in some of my states have gone in and done different beautification, grounds enhancement types of projects. So maybe that includes planting flowers, cutting down the bushes outside of the hospital, 
Um, or maybe there's a community um, a community component built in where seniors come in or different individuals come in and um, maybe they help replace the carpet or <laughs> paint the walls and things of that nature, to paint murals uh, to make it more inviting. So there's lots of different things in terms of that area that um, I believe that, you know, that our members have helped contribute to and then also present opportunities uh, for them to contribute to. Also, when you think about community engagement, um, when you think about event and volunteer coordination, whether it be health fairs, um, getting out more into the community, working with other health organizations, uh, when it comes to anything that maybe takes a little bit more than the norm volunteers, helping to coordinate those types of events, our members would probably be a great asset in those types of events. And we really look forward to having them involved in, in those types of things. And of course, uh, uh, with COVID-19, um, they were um, highly involved in logistical support and at vaccination sites uh, at those times and needs when there's like high, you know, high volumes of individuals and uh, when they needed to kind of help with parking and things like that and, and traffic and all kinds of things. Things. Our members were there to kind of help with some of those things as well. So that's something to think about, you know, when um, when when there's a high need uh, and a, a different type of need, then we can come and kind of rise and kind of uh, assist with that as well. But with all of these types of um, service opportunities, it was kind of really great because when you think about the age of our members, which is 18 to 26, it's really a great and wonderful opportunity for them. Um, to shadow and work, um, it really kind of influences sometimes their their um, life after dis decisions and what they want to do with their lives. And so to be able to to serve in this capacity and to meet different professionals and kind of help guide them um, and kind of seeing what areas they want to go to and all of this um, is very beneficial for our members as well. All right, next slide, please. So when you're thinking about, okay, so how do I, you know, uh, any of this kind of as we kind of come to this next stage um, after the pandemic, uh, you know, even though I, I feel like a lot of agencies and I know a lot of um, organizations are still dealing with a loss of volunteers and maybe haven't built that back up yet. And so one thing that our members can really kind of assist in is thinking about, okay, so we've had anything that's really impacted your workforce. So maybe you've had a considerable loss of volunteers, or maybe the there's an increase or a strain on your resources with your staff, and you really could use an extra hand to, to do some of the other, um, in addition to what the, the normal workday requires, um, or just, you know, just anything that's kind of make a major impact on the operations and you could use that into that um, additional assistance. So any of those areas, um, you know, we want to think about maybe this would be a good fit to have that extra eight to 10 people come in and really get some things done um, with, with all of that. Next slide, please. So how do you apply? It's an easy, one, two, three <laughs> step. So first you want to contact your regional campus uh, and I'll kind of show you contacts in just a little bit, but you'll want to reach out to your assistant program director. One of, uh, there's several folks that do the same position that I, that I have um, within each region. And when you talk to that individual, um, you can talk, share kind of ideas, work with that person on asking any questions specifically that you have about the program, about our members, and things of that nature. And we're very excited and happy to talk with you. Um, each of our campuses have great assistant program directors um, that are willing to, to work and kind of help you think through ideas. And, um, you know, so feel free to reach out to, to us and we, we're happy to do, you know, kind of help you think through um, how do you utilize a team because we're here to help meet the need. So maybe you didn't see something on my list, but you could say, oh, I really think a really, you know, a group of eight to 10 young adults could do a really great job um, in making this happen. Um, just throw the idea out there and we'd be happy to consider that. Um, also, the kind of the next step is completing a concept form. I um, mean, when you think about the, the concept form, um, it's kind of almost a letter of intent. 
And so uh, the main thing that's in our concept form is kind of the need. What is the need that is being addressed with the team coming? And what will you have them doing? So along with a little bit of other contact information and things of that nature, you want to have those two kind of main ideas or thoughts kind of in your head when you're thinking about the concept form. And then that last step is once you've submitted your concept form, a few weeks later, you'll be invited to submit an application. And with the application, generally you have the opportunity to once again, contact us, we'll talk you through the application. Um, it's not once we give you the application, you're out there on your own, we're there to support you through that. Um, also, a lot of us offer an opportunity for feedback too. So I know our campus, um, a week or two before the deadline of the, the final application, we ask you to submit the application for early review and we'll give you feedback and you have the opportunity to resubmit that before the deadline. Um, so we're happy to help provide that assistance um, to make sure you have the best application that you can have. Okay, next slide, please. So these are, uh, this is an idea of kind of how our program year is structured. And I apologize, I think the date, the, the, it got, when it transferred, it uh, got a little bit off, I'm noticing. Um, so I apologize for that. Uh, but for our Southern campus, uh, which I'm out of, um, you'll notice that we have almost, we've almost followed the, um, almost like a school year. So our teams arrive in in the summertime, they go through about a month of training, and then we start to send them out in communities in August, and then they wrap up around May. And so, um, and then you'll notice that for our round one, we actually have an application deadline on today. <laughs> so for teams to start in August, uh, they and, and serve through October of this year, uh, they would actually, you know, someone would submit an application, uh, excuse me, a concept form today. Uh, you could either go to our website or reach out to your assistant program director and get that concept form. Then the full application would be due in June. And so, um, you would submit that uh, concept form. And you notice it's almost like a four month type of process. The concept form is submitted in April and then by August, you're, you'll receive a team, you, you know, and then, um, so it, it's almost kind of that, that area of planning between, between April to August. So our different campuses on a different schedule, and I apologize, it, it looks like our Southwest, um, that, that row was cut off, but I can, I know we have a few folks that are from Arkansas and Missouri, and they actually have a concept form coming up June 16th. So they're around, they'll be starting, we all start on different times, our different campuses. And so our round this year starts on in August. They have a little bit later start this year. And so their round one starts November 3rd and goes through December the 17th. Their concept form will be due June 16th and their full application will be due August the 11th. And similar to us, they have multiple kind of rolling deadlines for different rounds, um, but that's kind of the most one that's coming up right now. And then we can see the North, I think it's showing on the screen, the one from North Central. They have, they're kind of wrapping up one of their program year. Um, and so, May 2nd will be their concept form deadline uh, for rounds uh, beginning in September and October. So I'm not sure if we had anyone that fell in our North Central that's on the call today, but um, that kind of shows you that we're all kind of in different cycles, uh, but there's kind of this opportunity to apply multiple times throughout the year for different rounds, depending on maybe when you think your most time of need, like this is a high impact time, we really kind of uh, we really, you know, have an, a increased clientele, things of that nature. Oh, we have a lot of programming going on during that time. And so we really could use that additional assistance. Next slide, please. All right. So with AmeriCorps and Triple C, I know with some of our other AmeriCorps programs, there is a call share um, or um, something of that nature. But for Triple C, there's no charge uh, to help support a team. But we do ask sponsors provide to provide the lodging 
Um, and that can look a lot of different types of ways, right? Um, so that could mean them staying with a partner agency. Maybe there's a local church. Um, we don't require them to have, it doesn't need to be really fancy. Uh, they can use cots if they need to be, <laughs> um, you know, and then also there's the opportunity to maybe, um, so, you know, maybe there's um, other community agencies that could really use a, the support of AmeriCorps and Triple C team. And so maybe that agency has the housing. And so maybe you all can work together. Um, for to have a team for a period of four to six weeks or, or eight to ten weeks and a part of that time is with the partner agency and part of that time is supporting your organization um, or your hospital and so what also we the addition to that we also ask that our sponsors provide the project materials uh, we're basically providing the 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 labor <laughs> the boots on the ground but we ask that you uh, support the project materials, and then also the training and orientation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they're, they're young adults uh, that are coming in, they're unskilled, and so they're actually looking for those opportunities to, to learn more and gain more experience. And so they're not going to necessarily come in knowing what role you want them to play, um, but they're very open and are quick learners. And if, if you could just have someone, staff or volunteer to provide the training, that's important to kind of get them off to a good start. Um, but then also we ask that you provide 40 hours of work week and that can look from, I mean, it kind of depends on what your need. That can be an eight hour, uh, you know, eight hour day for, you know, Monday through Friday, or maybe that's Maybe, no, you need them on Saturdays and Sundays, and it's just maybe they work four days a week, 10 hours a day, and that includes a Saturday, Sunday um, type of work day. Um, it really kind of depends on, you know, the shifts that you need. They can do different shifts, things of that nature. Um, it can vary depending on what your needs are, right? And so in addition to making sure that they have that 40 hours of enriching service, you also want to ensure that they have the supervision that's needed. So we ask and require that you provide at least uh, a minimum of 50% of the, the hours that they serve. So for a 40 hour work week, that would be 20 hours a week. And that could be a super, you know, that doesn't necessarily have to be one designated person. It could be multiple people. It can be a lead volunteer. Um, it, and depending on what task, it could be a different individual. So, you know, um, the more supervision probably is needed at the beginning when they're first getting started or depending on the, the how challenging the task may be, depend, depends on how much supervision is needed. Uh, but that is one requirement that we ask that you do supervise at least 50% of the time. Hey, right, next slide, please. Um, so in addition to that, there are a few things that we provide as well. Uh, we're sending our team there in a 15 passenger van. They come ready, <laughs> ready. So they're there. They can get from one place to the next. Um, also, the team leader that I mentioned earlier is there on site to help him serve as a li liaison um, and support the team. We also have unit leaders that are staff. Uh, that supervise those team leaders and teams. And so if you want to talk with staff members, there's also that, op also that opportunity uh, to have that support as well. But that team leader is on site. Um, also, our members, we realize that they work with different vulnerable populations. So we make sure that they're coming to you with uh, background checks. Um, and uh, at this, our, and our teams up to this point have been fully vaccinated. Um, some other things that we cover um, with them serving with the federal uh, program, they come in with workers comp and we also offer them some health benefits. Um, also, they get a budget for food. Uh, they at the last year or so, they recently got a bump. So they get uh, $6.10 a day <laughs> that they budget and they make it happen. They work. So the main thing with their housing, when you're thinking about it, you want to make sure they have access to a kitchen so that they can use their money wisely and um, uh, cook that way or provide uh, meals if, if that's a possibility. But we really, you know, they, they can um, help prepare their own meals if you have housing that does that. But they do live on a, on a tight budget to make uh, and, and need access to that. And also we do send them with laundry and some other um, things if needed. All right. Next slide, please. 
So these are just a couple of comments um, in terms of when our teams were working with hospitals or working with other organizations. Um, you know, uh, they really can come in, like I said earlier, and bring in lots of energy. Uh, and they really want to see, you know, ways that they can really support and ways of what are the needs. They want to find out how, what are the needs of that area and how can I best serve um, to help support the 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 organization that they're supporting, but then also the people that they're supporting. Um, and our members really do uh, kind of bring bring that. Um, and it's exciting to actually be just a staff member and work with them. Um, next slide, please. So this is your, per, your contact information. Um, of course, I'm Tamika Eatman, and if you're from Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, or Tennessee, I'm actually your personal contact, and you can reach out to me. Um, for anyone, I know that we had a, several folks that, I don't know if I saw anyone from Kentucky, but Stephanie also works in our office. Um, I know I saw some folks from Arkansas and Missouri on the call. Um, so feel free to reach out to either you can email the general email for those campuses, but then also um, you'll notice on this slide I've provided direct contact uh, for for individuals. Um, so, you know, just depending on what you you know, what state or region you're from, then you'll have a contact and, and we'll be happy to work with you to help you apply. We want to definitely see applications uh, coming in. Uh, soon. I know that April 27th is a little bit of a short deadline <laughs> for those, but you notice that we have another one coming right around the corner uh, for the states that's in our region. So I would love to see some applications coming in. Um, Kim, I don't know if there's any questions or. Yeah, I don't see any so far. If you do have any, please just submit those in the chat um, or, or kind of save them to the end and we'll let Christina kind of jump off. But um, yeah, or jump in. All right. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. If anything comes up, feel free to put it in that chat and we'll be monitoring. Otherwise, we'll let Christina. Good morning. We'll chat about the Delta Doctors Program uh, for a few moments today. Next slide. I am Christina Wood and I serve as Health Programs Manager for Delta Regional Authority. We are a federal agency, pretty young. We were established in 2000 and we help to, well, we make strategic investments in basic public infrastructure, transportation improvements, workforce training, small business development and entrepreneurship, local and regional leadership and access to quality health care. Next slide. Here's our region. We serve 252 counties and parishes throughout eight states along the Mississippi um, River and also the Alabama, Alabama Black Belt. So access to care, 241 of 252 counties and parishes that we serve are in a health professional shortage area. I think we all know what that means. Um, and also 244 of the 252 counties and parishes that we serve are in a medically underserved area. And here's kind of a, a map of what it looks like to be in a health professional shortage area. The darker the green, the higher the score, uh, the more of the shortage. So if you kind of look at where we serve our footprint from Southern Illinois down through Louisiana, you see some dark green. So we're in, um, we serve an area that's, um, there's a, there's a pretty, pretty, um, pretty good health shortage, a shortage of physicians. Next slide. Same case here uh, in terms of the medically underserved area. Most of our area is in orange or gray. Um, so most, again, I believe 241 of the 252 counties and parishes are in medically underserved areas. Next slide. So that is why um, the Delta Regional Authority, we created the Delta Doctors Program, or we didn't create the Delta Doctors Program. We implemented the program and we call it the Delta, Doctor Pro Delta Doctors Program. So this program allows uh, foreign physicians who wish to stay in the country, they're already here on a J-1 visa studying. It allows them to stay in the country if they commit to serving within our footprint for three years. So as a federal agency, we're an interested party. So we have a, we serve a footprint. There's a, there's a shortage of physicians. So 
the Department of State allows us to make recommendations to them for physicians to come work in our footprint uh, because we do have a need. So who can apply for this um, program? Foreign physicians, uh, both primary care and specialists, they have to commit to serving in the footprint for three years. They have to work 40 hours a week or 160 hours per month. And they have to provide direct patient care to individuals regardless of their ability to pay. And also, of course, they have to comply with our guidelines. Next slide. So what is an eligible area? Remember we chatted about uh, 241 of the 252 counties are in a medically underserved area and 244 of the 252 are in a health professional shortage area. So there are certain portions of our footprint that don't fall within a HIPS or MUA. We are not allowed to place or make, recommendation, re make recommendations for physicians to serve in those areas. So uh, the hospital or the healthcare facility must be located in a health professional shortage area or a medically underserved area in our footprint. Next slide. So how do you get started? So this, this can be a barrier. So it's very important that a healthcare facility, an employer must recruit. We must have proof of recruitment efforts for 45 days before you engage in a contract with a physician. So we wanna make sure that we are not taking jobs from American physicians that are looking. So we have to show that an employer has uh, made a good faith effort to recruit an American physician. Next slide. So what does the application process look like? Um, it is it's not as easy as Tamika. <laughs> she said, one, two, three, and you're done. Um, each employer, we are, we have to have an immigration attorney that represents the employer submit the application to us because it's, you know, it's, it's very important that the documentation is correct and that we have a letter of an opinion from an immigration attorney that says, hey, everything in this application is true. This position is uh, based on the documentation within the application eligible for uh, program participation. Next slide. So there are about 20 items that you have to gather with your immigration attorney to submit to DRA. We'll just run through these really quickly. The first um, is a form that the attorney has to complete that says, yes, I am representing this, um, this employer and this is the, the physician that will be applying for the J-1 visa waiver. We have to have a cover letter from the employer and it, the two most important things that need to be here, the patient to physician ratio. So the patient to physician ratio really shouldn't fall below one to 1200. So that means for every 1200 folks in Pemiscot County, Missouri, there's only one cardiologist. Um, that's our threshold. When it falls below that, we have to do a little bit more digging, but that helps us to show a need. Uh, and also we have to have three years worth of data in terms of who the employer has served. So we want to make sure that the employer is serving individuals that utilize Medicare, Medicaid, or those who are self-pay. Uh, the third item is the Department of the State data sheet. This is something that the attorney will do for you. I'll just say that. Um, and number four is a CV with a social security number for the uh, physician. Next slide. Number five, this is another form um, that your attorney is a one pager. This is why it's so important to have an immigration attorney uh, package these items because most of the items, you know, you wouldn't be familiar with, or you wouldn't work with them on a day-to-day -day basis. And number six is pretty important. We have to have a signed, executed contract between the employer and the hospital. And you see what we're looking for here. We wanna make sure the uh, physician will serve in the region for three to five years. There can't be a non-compete clause. So you can't say after this three years, you can't, you can't open up your own practice in this area. We can't, we're not allowed to um, have a non-compete compete clause in the contract. And again, the physician has to work 160 hours per month or 40 hours per week, and they have to commit to serving patients regardless of their ability to pay. And of course, we want to know where the physician is working. So the name and address of each work site. Next slide. 
Item seven through 13, again, we have to have proof that the employer is located or the work site is in a HISPA or an MUA. Number eight and nine are, are immigration forms that your attorney will assist you in. Um, we have to have a letter of opinion from the uh, legal representation that says, hey, everything in this application is true and correct. Um, 11 and 12 are our program guidelines that say, hey, you're going to turn in your compliance reports on time um, and you're going to basically abide by what your contract says. Number 13, proof of pre prevailing wage data. We have to make sure that the physician, the foreign physicians are getting paid appropriately. So we don't want to see any wage fall below level one of prevailing wage. Next slide. Recruitment documentation, very important. Again, this is kind of the first step. We have to show that the employer recruited for 45 days on a national level. So that could be Indeed, um, WebMD, we have to show that the employer made a good faith effort to recruit an American physician. We also have to have letters of community support, letters of recommendation, and of course the copies of board certification, the state medical licensing for the physician. And 18, we have to make sure that the facility that the um, physician will work in actually exists. Next slide. Last few items here. Um, we need a copy of the posted public notice of sliding fee payment for each facility. So we have to know that the employer is offering some type of sliding fee uh, based on income for patients that come in to receive services. We have to have a list of the primary care physicians or specialists in the county or parish. So just want to make sure that there's actually a need for radiologist or cardiologist. We don't want to... Um, request that a physician come work in the region when, when there's no need. 21 is a copy of the passport. And then of course, lastly, we'll need a statement from the physician, just you know, acknowledging that yes, they're submitting this application. They would like to work in the footprint. Just wanna hear from the physician. Next slide. Compliance guidelines. So once a physician is on board, um, we have to, have the employment verification form. So within one week of employment, we like to see that the physician is on board. It's just a one pager. And then every six months, the employer and the hospital submits the DRA, a compliance survey just says, this is what we've been doing. This is uh, how many patients we've served. And you know, this is how things are going for me at the facility. And we can conduct a visit uh, unannounced um, during the three-year service period for the physician. Next slide. The Comrade 30 waiver program. So um, the Comrade 30 waiver program is offered through each state. So each state has 30 slots or 30 recommendations that they can make to the Department of State for foreign physicians to come work in the footprint or come work in the state, sorry. Um, DRA doesn't have a limit on the number of physicians that we can make recommendations for, and we don't have an application period. So we accept applications all year round, and we can process as many as I can process. So there's no limit there. That's, that's really the only difference between Conrad 30 and the Delta Doctors Program. Next slide. And here's your contact on each state level for the Conrad 30 program, because typically we'll see um, an employer apply through Conrad 30 and maybe they need six doctors. And as you can see, those slots fill up pretty quickly. So they'll come to DRA and say, hey, we have, we're in need of a cardiologist in this Paris in Louisiana. We'll process the application because the slots have been filled through the state's Conrad 30 program. Next slide. There are a couple of books that I picked up when I first started um, overseeing this program. The first one is the Physician Immigration Handbook. Um, and the second one is the Foreign Physicians Immigration Handbook by Barry Walker, who's a, an attorney in Mississippi. Um, these are just two resources that I thought I'd put out there for you. Very helpful. Um, everything's in layman's terms. So if you'd like to um, pick those up, 
They're very helpful. I think I, I think I rolled through that pretty quickly, <laughs> more quickly than what I thought I would. If there are any questions, just let me know. Just, you know, this program is, is not that complicated. It's just a lot of documentation that has to be submitted on the front end. Um, these physicians are here studying um, in the United States. And after their studies are over, they're required to go back home for two years. Um, so what our program does is it allows them to waive that two-year requirement if they commit to working in our footprint for three years. So instead of going back to their home country after their studies, if they commit to working in the Delta in our footprint, they're allowed to stay for three years under all of the circumstances that we just talked about. So it's a wonderful program. Uh, it's not a recruitment program. So DRA doesn't recruit the physicians. We, when we get the application, the healthcare facility has already found the physician and they're, um, they're ready to go in terms of submitting an application. Kim? Yes, I see there's a question for you. Um, if an organization is having trouble finding a provider, what is usually your suggestions for them? We, uh, again, we're not, uh, we don't recruit. So 3RNet is a good way to um, recruit physicians. You have to, of course, put, put an ad out there. Um, we see ads coming through. Uh, indeed, uh, we online advertisement. When I ask for proof of recruitment, that is where most of uh, employers have success in recruiting on a national level through online recruitment. Thank you. And I think that recruitment has to happen all the time. So it's not kind of a one time deal where if you need a hospitalist, you just recruit. And once you get the hospitalist, it's done. It is very difficult to recruit physicians to our region. So recruitment is ongoing, job fairs. Um, you just really have to, to make an ongoing effort um, to recruit. Anyone, there any other? Yeah, any other questions out there from anyone or comments or thoughts or experiences or you know any of the above for either Christina or, or Tamika as well? This is fantastic information. Um, for sure. I think we have one. While well, folks are still thinking, um, we have some, yeah, there we go. We have some polling questions. Um, so the post polling, we would love to launch those and get you thinking on those um, before we wrap up. I will say, Kim, while folks are answering those questions, um, in terms of recruiting a physician, I know that um, some employers send letters to medical schools throughout the country and, and they say, hey, we're looking for a cardiologist or a hospitalist. So letters to medical schools and uh, emails now, I don't think most people do snail mail, uh, but that's just another, another method of recruitment through the medical schools. Yeah, Thank absolutely, you. absolutely. Anyone else have anything out there for either one of our experts here, our subject matter experts in real health resources? Well, if something comes up later, we'll be sending we'll be sending this deck out and it will have their information um, either for Christina or Tamika. Um, and if it's um, for someone other outside of Tamika's region, I know she will be happy to forward that information along. Or you can always just get in touch with us here at the center, any one of us, and we'll be happy to, to get that information to them. But they're highly um, responsive and they will get back with you if there are questions or anything. So, all right, with that, we will sign off for today and we'll see you all next time. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Tamika. We greatly appreciate your time today and your expertise. And we appreciate everybody attending with us as well. Thank you. Have a great day. All right, you too.